Believe it or not, it's 10 o'clock. Good morning. <laughs> the sign of uh, good community is that you don't want to stop chit-chatting. You want to keep it going, so this is a good sign. Welcome to this gathering. Welcome to Sunday morning at SSUC, Southminster Steinhauer United Church, where we are spiritual seekers united in community. As we know, those of us who hold this circle week by week, uh, this is a place that we, where we work hard to make a safer space for all people. No matter who you are, you're welcome here. If, you've, uh, if you're here a lot of the time, or if you're here for the first time, or the first time in a while, and look at that, I'm seeing people I know in the back row. <laughs> Some of my family showed up, how about that? This is a safe place to be yourself and to ask our questions. It's a safe place to explore our inner workings and our human experience. This is a place where we seek to find wisdom wherever it comes. It doesn't just have to be where you would think it would come from in a Christian congregation. We seek our wisdom from all places and all sources that have something positive and spiritual to say to our living of our most deeply human lives. If we have intentions to live well, to live more closely to our highest ideals and values, then we're amongst those who wish to do the same. And we can explore that here. So as we build community with one another based on honest relationships and authentic spirituality, our quest to be good, authentic, deeply thinking people, we gather together in this place once again. And we're all welcome here. So welcome to each of you. Welcome to this place and welcome to this gathering. We have uh, the opportunity to celebrate Pride Month here this morning, uh, which will not feel a lot different than any other Sunday morning because we're always proud, we're always diverse, uh, we always celebrate uh, being exactly who we are. So, uh, but this is a chance to do so in a specific way. And, um, and Janet is making her way up here because she has an invitation for us all that involves what we might do after this gathering. Are you ready, Janet?
with gratitude. We are gathered on the storied land, traditional meeting ground, gathering place and traveling route of Cree and Soto, Blackfoot, Métis, Diné, Nakota Sioux peoples, native land to so many indigenous peoples and adopted home to migrants from so many lands. All of us seeking to be faithful to our commitments as members of Treaty 6 territory. All of us seeking a place we can call home with deep gratitude, whatever our history or heritage, whatever our time and place in life, whatever our questions or our hopes, our dreams, our fears, our joys, we this day gather in gratitude on this good and generous land. And we light this candle in the light of a new day, a new week, a new moment, a new beginning, a breath none of us has ever breathed before. With this flame in our midst, we light this candle as a symbol of our intention to live in ways that seek our common good, in ways that reflect the light of love in ways that honor and express our pride in who we are and in who we are together as we honor the light in one another. Who's ready for a story? This is our time for all ages. I welcome anyone who wants to come to the carpet for a story. And I know many of you don't come to the carpet, but you complain just as loudly when there's no story. So I know, <laughs> I know this really is a time for all ages. Good morning. <clears throat> I went on a trip. This is how much I love stories. I went on a trip a long, long way away, and I saw this book, and I read it in a bookshop, and I thought, I should remember that. So I took my phone out, and I took a picture of it. The stores don't usually like that, probably, but I took a picture of the front of this book, and then I thought, I have to remember that. And then I came home, and I thought, I have to find that book. It was so good, and I found it. It's called Frankfurt. <laughs> I wasn't in Frankfurt. That's a city, too, but I wasn't in Frankfurt. But Frankfurt, it's about a dog. And I want to read it to you. It's by Mia Cassani and M Michael Cassell. He, like he does look like a hot dog. You're absolutely right. <laughs> <clears throat> Pierre and his dog Frankfurt lived together in a beautiful flat, that means apartment, at the very top of a tall building. Although the flat was small, it was perfect for them. They had done everything together ever since the day Pierre had found Frankfurt. It had been a Friday night and Pierre was heading home when he heard a strange noise coming from a nearby street. He went to have a closer look and there he found a tiny Frankfurt curled up in an old shoebox. You poor thing, why are you all alone, said Pierre. You could come home with me. At first, Pierre had been a little worried about his new companion. What if he was badly behaved? It was of vital importance that Frankfurt didn't chew on his prized sneakers or scratch his beloved collection of vinyl. But Frankfurt turned out to be the best behaved dog imaginable. Frankfurt never slurped or made any noise when sipping his tea each morning. He always waited patiently for Pierre's meal to arrive before starting to eat his own. His favorite food was salmon, salmon sushi, and he loved sharing a fizzy drink. Wow. On Saturdays, Frankfurt would go with Pierre to buy the newspaper. Before leaving the house, he would peer out the window to check the weather and see if he should take a scarf. 
And although he enjoyed the trip to the shop, he really loved coming back home to read the newspaper with Pierre. He was very well read. <laughs> Every night before bed, when, while Pierre was dancing to his favorite music, Frankfurt would arrange his toys and scarves by size and color. <laughs> Do you like organizing things? It's fun. They lived together happily in this perfect little world, except for one thing. There was one thing that upset Frankfurt. That thing was a word, a word that put him in a very bad mood every time he heard it. When that sound met his ears, his usually neat fur would stand on end and he would growl. That one word was his name. What an ugly word. Frankfurt was not an original name for a sausage dog. A Dachshund named Frankfurt? Come on, man. No one will ever take me seriously with a name like that, the poor dog said. Do I call Pierre Spaghetti because he's tall and skinny? It's so humiliating to be named after a sausage. One morning at the park, already very tired of his name, Frankfurt came up with a plan. Every time he heard his name, he would lie down on the ground and play dead hoping that Pierre would realize why he was so upset. He was determined that his plan would not fail. Seeing the strange reaction that Frankfurt was having every time his name was called, Pierre became a little worried. He gave him water, he tried playing with him to see if it would cheer him up, but nothing worked. Pierre began to feel anxious. He didn't know what to do. Oh, these humans, they are useless, thought Frankfurt lying on his back with one eye open. Eventually, Pierre began to calm down and thought about what the reason could be for his friend's strange behavior. Your fur is standing on end and you growl every time I call your name. Are you telling me you don't like the name Frankfurt, said Pierre. Frankfurt suddenly rolled over onto his back again and played dead. Ah, no problem, boy. Are you happy for me to call you Frank? <coughs> said Pierre. Frank jumped up with excitement and wagged his tail. And from that day, Pierre and his dog Frank lived happily ever after in their beautiful flat at the top of a very tall building. <laughs> I want to talk to you for just one minute about our names. Frankfurt did not like his name. And you know what? Frankfurt isn't alone. There are people who, when they hear their name, they think, that's just not me. And so, at some point, if they're lucky in their lives, they get a chance to choose a name for themselves that speaks about who they are, who they really are on the inside. And when, and when, uh, when someone has that chance to, to have a name that matches who they are perfectly, like Frank, then it's beautiful because then their name and their body and their insides and their outsides can all match. So I love, I love that we all have a name and that we can grow in that name. And if that name maybe when we're grown-ups, if that name just isn't quite right, we have the chance to make it right. That is something special that we can live into who we really are. It's important that we are who we are at every step. So, if you're free to be you and I'm free to be me, that means we can uh, do what we like to do in the next little while. Our programs, Kid Spirit, is done for, for the season, but that doesn't mean there's nothing to do. We can, there's a playroom we can play in, there's an activity table with some uh, interesting...
Frankfurt was a new news story. Let's listen to an old, old one. This is a story found in the Christian writings from the book of Mark. Jesus and his followers came to the other side of a lake, to the country of the Gerasenes. And when he had stepped out of the boat, immediately a man came out of the tombs, ranting and raving. He lived among the tombs, and no one could restrain him anymore, even with a chain. For he'd often been restrained with shackles and chains, but the chains were always wrenched apart, and the shackles he broke into pieces, and no one had the strength to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs and on the mountains, he was always howling, bruising himself with stones. And when he saw Jesus from a distance, he ran, and he bowed down before him, and he shouted at the top of his voice, Why have you come to me? Are you here to torment me too? But Jesus calmed him, and then he asked him, What is your name? And the one who was living among the dead said, My name is Mob, for we are many. In the words of this first century story, may we find wisdom for our living. These are the words of Mary Oliver, found in a collection of her poetry called New and Selected Poems, published many years ago. Poem is entitled Sunrise. You can die for it, an idea or the world. People have done so brilliantly, letting their small bodies be bound to the stake, creating an unforgettable fury of light. But this morning, climbing the familiar hills in the familiar fabric of dawn, I thought of China and India and Europe, and I thought how the sun blazes for everyone, just so joyfully as it rises under the lashes of my own eyes, And I thought, I am so many. What is my name? What is the name of the deep breath I would take over and over for all of us? Call it whatever you want. It is happiness. It is another one of the ways to enter the fire. In the words of this contemporary poem,
the name we wear in life isn't like jewelry. It isn't a mere accessory. It's central to our identity. I remember how I felt when I learned the name by which I was known in my birth family. And somehow I knew that had I been Mary Smear in this world, I would be different than being Nancy Steves. Our name isn't just incidental to our identity. Chances are if the name you were given didn't really fit, you found one that did. You shortened it or you used your middle name instead or you got a nickname that stuck. Chances are if you were given a name that didn't fit, you claimed one that did. Or many of us have had the experience of adjusting to a new name in life. Sometimes taking on the name of another family as you took on a new role as a spouse, a partner. Or sometimes reclaiming a name that was given at birth and never used. Or sometimes dropping a name that was given at birth that just didn't fit. Just like Frank. He was in Frankfurt. He was Frank. We not only each have the name we're given at birth, but we also have the names that life assigns us along the way. Life calls us average, or above average, or below average. Life calls us clumsy, or coordinated, beautiful, or handsome, plain, or ugly. Life calls us cool, or it calls us a fag or we are the overbite, or we're the obese patient, or we are the gallbladder in bed seven, or we're prisoner number such and such, or we're orthodox or heretical, traditional or progressive. We're Tory or grit, Andy or green, we're liberal or conservative, we're gay or straight or bi or trans or two-spirit or non-binary. We're normal or eccentric. We're practical or we're airy-fairy. Or we're named ADHD or FASS or bipolar or OCD or just BAD. <laughs> you know? Because not only are we named in life, but we're also labeled not just in this acronym-driven era that we live in, but it would seem that we have been giving each other labels for as long as we've been giving each other names. Among the stories passed down to us in the Jesus tradition, we have that peculiar story Chris read for us a moment ago, a story that's often told as an exorcism, a story of strange things that happen on the other side of the sea, the strange side of the sea, which is to say the Gentile side of the Galilee, since those who are writing this story are writing it from the perspective of those who live on the Jewish communities on their side of the Galilee. So this story is set where those other people live. And the narrator hurries to apply the label in the second sentence. To the very first listeners of this story, it would come as no surprise that the first person Jesus meets on that strange side of the sea over there personifies all the chaos and weirdness about life on that side. All the projections and all the stereotypes folding in all the rumors and gossips about those others as uncivilized, living in the cemetery among the dead, rantingly mad. And the first words the story puts in Jesus' mouth 
is to ask the man his name. Tell me your name. Tell me who you are. How do you identify yourself? And notice his answer. My name is Mob, for we are many. My name is Legion because there is an army in me. My name is Tormented because I'm so fragmented. Surely this is not the name any parent gave him. Sticks and stones didn't break his bones, but names have surely hurt him. There are so many things to hear in his answer. Is it that he's been labeled for so long that he didn't even remember his name? Is it that his name hasn't mattered to anybody for so long he has ceased to even call himself by name? Or is it that he's grown so fragmented by being marginalized or being brutalized or being misunderstood or isolated or alienated or ostracized or bullied into finding community only among the dead, that this is the name he calls himself. I'm a mob. Or is it that he is actually naming the sanest response in a world gone mad for power, for money, for domination, for control, for self-centeredness? Is it like saying my name is crazy for all I can see and hear in the world is madness? This is one of those stories that's a parable of the human experience. A story of our human journey of our search for wholeness and holiness amid our brokenness and our fragmentation. And notice, in the world of this ancient story, notice what happened when someone cared to know his name, cared to see beyond his symptoms, cared to listen beyond what was being said and to hear what was under his words, when someone cared to know the hurts that caused him to disintegrate, to see beyond the slashings and the cutting of himself, when someone, even a stranger, cared to know more than the labels he'd been given when someone wanted to know his true and given name and all the voices he had internalized within himself began to be silenced and a healing began. Whatever our name and to whatever degree we too know what it is to be a mob, There is within each of us all the people we've been in our lives, all the roles we've played, all the names we've been called and have called ourselves, all the labels we've worn. We've been frank in a world where everyone is calling us Frankfurt. We all know the experiences of being in exile in our own skin, to feel the crowdedness in our heads with all the competing voices telling us who to be and where to go and what to do, and our hearts are broken into so many pieces by life's losses. We're the young person dancing in the heart of the old man. We are so many. And at the end of the story, The man who had felt like a mob, the man who had kept company with the departed. At the end of the story, he wants to go with Jesus and his friends back to the other side of the sea. He wants to leave this place and go with the one who has been the source and catalyst of his healing. But instead of being invited to join the Jesus journey in going to the other side of the sea, 
Jesus invites him to go home. To leave the graveyard, to move out of the cemetery, and to go home. To go home to himself and to his family and to his friends and to his community, to his world. Just as the story invites all of us in our fragmentedness, in our madness, in our brokenness, in our splintered selves, the story invites us to a homecoming. To come home to ourselves, to make peace with the legion of who we are and who we've been, to forgive ourselves and each other, to forgive life for its hurts and its losses, and to weave those experiences of life into the wholeness of who we are so we can speak our true name in the world. On this day when we celebrate the beginning of Pride Week in our city, we know all too well the dangers of name calling and labeling. And in this month in which we honor National Indigenous Peoples Day, we know all too well the dangers of taking away someone's name, taking away someone's language, taking away someone's essence, taking away someone's identity. And we also know how to name ourselves and one another beloved. To name one another beloved in ways that inspire pride, enable us to thrive, and help us learn that there are so many ways for us to use our human and incredible power to name life, to name each other, to name ourselves. So what better time could there be for us to consider the name we call ourselves beyond the names we're given to wear in the world? What's the name of the deepest truth we seek to express by being ourselves in the world? I'm so many. What is my name? What is the name of the deep breath I would take over and over for all of us. We're going to sing a song together, you and me, and uh, it's a song uh, I originally wrote uh, for our January 20th anniversary of our uh, being, becoming an affirming community, and uh, it seems appropriate and time to, to sing it again. This time I want to invite you to sing along on the chorus. You'll see some notes and words up on the screen when it's time. It'll be new to you, so if you don't get it the first or the second time, maybe you'll get it the third time. Anyway, we'll learn it together, and we'll sing, we'll sing, uh, we'll sing this song with one another to celebrate this week. We are the wonder of 
the freedom to love as long. We are the prison, we are the bones, we are the friends that stand, that march so proud. We are the wonder of our true selves. We are the freedom to love out loud. We are the prism, we are the bow. We are the friends that stand, that march so proud. We built a circle of strength and love. Affirming our worth, beautiful as we are. We will not break this bond we've made. I'm stronger with you, you're stronger with me by far. Where our flag can fly, where we're free to be. If we stumble, we lean together, never silent, speaking up for you and me. We built a circle of strength and love, affirming our worth, beautiful as we are. We will not break this bond we've made. I'm stronger with you, you're stronger with me by far. things. Look how far we've come, this song we've sung. Our open arms and open doors, let everybody in, straight and queer, old and young. We built this circle of strength and love. Affirming our worth, beautiful as we are. We will not break this bond we've made. I'm stronger with you, you're stronger with me by far. We've built a circle. We've built a circle of strength and love, affirming our worth, beautiful as we are. We will not break this bond we've made. I'm stronger with you, you're stronger with me by far.
We might not clap for your announcements, Chris, but we'll clap every time you write a song. <laughs> and twice when you sing it. Each time we gather, we seek to strengthen our intentions, to live in ways that honor our highest humanity, that live our truest and deepest names. And so we offer these words with one another as we seek to speak our intentions, as we seek to pray together. We pause in gratitude for moments of discovery, honesty of deep connection, the release of tears, the easing of fears, and the renewing of wonder. We pause to honor our moments of disorientation when we're lost in our grief, in a search for something we can't quite name, captive to our worries, lost from ourselves and each other. As we open to the joy and pain of living, May we discover the grace of coming home to our truest and best selves. May it be so. We go to honor the unique light that is within each one of us, that spark of sacred we are in the world. We go with one another to honor the light we find in all beings, that unique spark of the sacred within each of us. We go to name and call forth one another in our truest and deepest and most authentic selves. We go to call one another home. We're going to share a closing song that we haven't sung for a very long time. And I wonder if it might be helpful for us just to hear the melody again. We're going to sing the chorus as the song starts. So if we hear the chorus and a verse, and then we'll come back to the chorus as we sing with one another a song called Coming Home, Words and Music of Carolyn McDade.
want to just invite you to sit for just a moment, and then I want to uh, share an invitation with you. And I'm going to ask Ainsley if she'll come and join me. Um, this is our invitation to all of you this morning. We are celebrating a wonderful occasion. <laughs> 20 years ago on June the 6th at, in Rio Terrace Moravian Church in West Edmonton, Chris was ordained by the Moravian Church you see him pictured on the right with his parents, Jim and Sheila, who are here this morning, and we're delighted that you're here with us. And you see him with this very fine, wonderful young lady who younger. has been married to him <laughs> since 1995, I think. So a journey that began 20 years ago that uh, really began, I think, earlier than that. I think it might have started in uh, Jim and Sheila's basement when Chris was a very young boy and uh, they began an Anglic a new Anglican uh, church community in their home that eventually um, found its, its uh, home in a, in a building. And um, then when Chris was about 15 and his feet didn't quite touch the pedals um, <laughs> and he wasn't yet uh, old enough to drive, he became the pianist uh, and the choir accompanist at Rio Terrace Church. And about four years later, when he was 19, I had the joy of meeting him. And uh, at that time, he was still the accompanist there. And in the following year, he became the choir director. And also, uh, in a year off from his studies during his undergraduate degree, had an opportunity to work with the pastor at that church, Dave Bennett, and got a lot of experience and wonderful opportunities. Um, that uh, began uh, and formed a foundation that we all uh, get to experience. Um, in 1996, Chris and Ainsley made their way to Bethlehem, Pennsylvania for Chris to attend the uh, Moravian Sem Seminary there. They were two when they left. When they came back, they were three. Noah, Noah joined the family in those, uh, those years in the U.S. and uh, Chris and Ainsley came back and Chris pastored Edmonton Moravian Church in the Mill Creek uh, neighborhood and while you were there along came Sophie and Daisy. Chris was there for nine years uh, from 1999 <coughs> until 2007, eight years. Yeah. Eight years. And then you all made your way as a family to a new venture in Mississauga, uh, a church plant called The Journey, and had a couple of years there before we began to woo you here. And uh, we started some conversations in 2009, and those of you that got to be here on Christmas Eve at the 11 o'clock service got your first opportunity to have a, a, a chance to meet Chris, and then he came on uh, in the spring of that year to cover my sabbatical and then uh, his own, the rest is history. <laughs> and, and we are so fortunate. So we celebrate this day, 20 wonderful years that have gifted us with your training, your experience, your passion, and your family and your gifts. And we have the great joy of uh, working together every day and um, we celebrate this anniversary. So we have cake and coffee.